Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you and a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for attending the event today. Before we start today's session, may I request all of you to please keep your mobile phone on silent mode through the length of the evening as a matter of courtesy to the proceedings. Thank you so much. Access Bank welcomes you to the seventh edition of our exclusive MSME Knowledge Series called Evolve. I would like to start the evening proceedings by introducing Mr. Bajoy Kapliar, Executive Vice President, SEG Segment Head, Access Bank. Our customers' voices and opinions matter to Access Bank, so we've shared a feedback form with you all to capture your voice. Request you to kindly fill in the form and hand it over at the registration table at the end of the session. Without much further ado, I would like to invite on stage our keynote speaker, Ms. Lena Lekhi, Founder, Managing Director and Chief Design Curator, Bagot India Private Limited. Manoj Lekhi, as she fondly calls it the other half, has strength of pillar, Chief Happiness Officer and Mr. Nagrajan, Chief Strategy Officer. Ms. Nina Lekhi, MD and Chief Design Curator Bagot, is an entrepreneur by profession and a role model for many aspiring entrepreneurs as she has started her journey from scratch. She's built a very popular vegan bag and accessories over the years. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Nina Lekhi, Mr. Manoj Lekhi and Mr. Nagrajan on the stage. Bagging college, because it's only going to be failed. I mean, next year, 
And I was like 17 years old. I was like, what am I supposed to do with myself one day? And I started to sell street in the class and I went to, you know, I took up a part-time job as a sales girl, selling carpets, doing all those kind of things. And then slowly, 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 slowly the business evolved. You know, it became a business from a hobby, a passion. I just thought making more, making screen printing canvas and that's because I thought that is something that's not there. I just wanted to vent out my creativity. And that is why it started, not like an objective, not like a vision, not like a mission. It just started here. So can I, so can I. And more so it was so can I and I can't be this failure papa. Yeah. Because I was not that kind I felt. So business started, it went well, but I also saw myself, you know, dealing with many emotions, like I told you I was an emotional person, you know, not being able to handle people. So my husband is over here today, Manu Shaky, who is my you know spiritual guy, mentor, who really hand holds me for my emotional and my you know in your side. So I would want you to give an example of how he seen the meaning of me that I should not die. When she said at 17, she was doing this, 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 so then she got married to me. <laughs> I got married to her. That's how. So I remember when we got married, she had, uh, she, earlier to her marriage, she was working from her house and she had one character working in her house. And I, I was also in the garment business and to retail shops. So uh, we had, so when she joined, I said, why don't you, you join? Is the same gala in Lalpa. Right now also she is there. So she had four carriers. She jumped from one to four. Four of them, I gave them some space in our gala. We had about 40 people working. She had four. I remember one day and I was coming and then suddenly I see you know, she takes this bag and throws it at her carriers. And I'm wondering, and we are sharing the same cabin. And I'm looking at it like, what is happening? And then next day I find no Karigar coming. There was a strike in her, 40 people are working with us, a fourth strike and they left the job. And uh, she had no Karigars. So that from that time means, like she said, emotional, yes, she was all the time bubbling, anything not going her way, bubbling with anger and throwing it. So that was the journey we started, I mean like that. So now she's having more than 800 people working with her. So I said, wow, that's a long way, you know, handling 800 different minds itself is fantastic. That was her journey uh, back how many years, more than 30 years. back. But now I've come a long way and I have worked a lot on myself. I don't know if this is relevant to other entrepreneurs really and I don't know what is expected or what would you like to hear. But I know that working on myself, working on my inner self has helped me tremendously. Because when I am grounded, when I am silent, when I am calm, I am much better to be able to handle any situation. Situation to hoigi, dhanda karenge, to up down to honei wala hai. Everything is not going to go as per budget. Right? <laughs> Keep looking at the finance people. Things are going to happen. Markets, no, no, China. I just, I just add on what she says is like we were taking a walk on, uh, on Burley Sea Face. I was walking with her mother actually. And she just told us, you just do this course, your mother is not well, why don't you all do it? Like good students, we said, okay, we'll do this particular meditation course. We did it and I didn't even know the aim of meditation at that time. Uh, so, uh, when we did it, then there was some shift inside us and we were both 25, 27 years old, 27 around. And that shift happened, so I went more deeper and then we went to deeper. Of course, business continued. So I just feel that, I mean, most of us here are in business. If you raise your hands, you're in business. Yeah. So more important than in business is like, I always ask her the question when she comes home. I don't know anything much about bags and all. But I, my one question is always there, how was your day? So how was your day means, in other words, she saying it was okay, good or fantastic. Okay, good and fantastic is not how much sales she made. Is how was her temperament during the days? That's the meaning. That was my question, and is even till today it is there. How was your day? How was your day means were you happy and this thing? Because finally, at the end of the days, these numbers will go on increasing in zero, zero, zeros, all those. 
But finally, did you enjoy your day? Did you enjoy? Are you peaceful? Are you relaxed? Are you happy? So that is my role in her life is to make sure that you know she enjoys the work. Yes, business grows and it is growing and it will grow on. And that's when Agrajan ji and Asha and so many of her team people come in. But finally, do you agree with me that happiness and I, there are two factors. Business must grow and you must have more and more free time for yourself. These two. So, I think for more than you can share about spending uh, out of seven days, she spent four days out in the outskirts which she will share uh, with, my daughter, with our daughter. And she gave three days only in the factory and four days with the daughter. So that speaks that you grow the business but you must have more free time and you must be happy. That is my role. So I she think can it's a combination. More. I think of you know the inner journey and how you enjoyed your day. I think a lot of us entrepreneurs may be feeling, at least I feel, yeah, skin is in the game, it's a bank ka loan hai, bank is all here today by chance. <laughs> I did not don't intend to say. But you know, generally that is the thought where an entrepreneur comes from. Yeah, my skin is in the game, what are you doing? Tiko padi nahi hai kya, ye kya, wo kya. And you know, excuses galore is what you know, I think many of us must be facing. I did face them many, many times. But always the way I looked at it was bringing my emotions down. And then I kept working on myself, like I said, the meditation, the inner growth, the silence. And that is one way that I could keep bringing my emotions up. And I felt and I feel that the more I bring up my emotions and my thoughts into casual world would be positivity, you know, into things that, okay, like more of trust, more of it's going to happen. Then suddenly then things start happening wonderfully for me. Yeah. And then when this, when I'm living in this cloud and this arena of positive and seeing things are happening the way I want, right? Like today we all see India, wow, it's going to be a wow story. This decade is our time, Maya. Right? All these years it was always China ka product hai, hum kya karenge, unka pricing deko, unki government ko ye hai. But today I think we all see this and I think Modi has also made us believe it. Right? And the more we believe it, the more we create it. And that is what I am seeing in my world of Baggett. And when I am in this energy and space, I have also attracted in my life someone like Nagarajan sir, who can help me, you know, not to control my emotions because my emotions to mujhe hi control karne hai. But outwardly to get the right, I don't know sir, you want to explain? Uh, if you permit, I'll sit and talk. Uh, so about five years back when I started working with Meena and back in, it was a small company, about 95 odd crore. And the first really, see, today it's about 200 crore, it's a medium sized company. And we have aspirations to be a large company. One of the key messages to the team at the point of time is you cannot be small because there are big guys who will excuse you from the top, there are small guys who will excuse you from the bottom, there is nothing like being small forever, right? And we said that we have got two choices, either we go micro or we have to go to medium and we have to grow large and that is the start of our transformational project five years back when everybody understood saying that you can't really grow in 10-15%, when you grow 10%, 5% is only inflation. And what is growing? You're growing at 4-5%, it's not really. Plus there is a lot of competition from abroad, China. And we early, we discovered that for our business, it's a difficult business, Asha will tell you, in fashion business, when you get it right, you make money. When you don't get it right, you lose money. Right? Because fashion Mindset, which most of the small and 
start small that means you have a large dream okay and then take everything step by step that was one second is you have a dream but don't get so stuck with the dream that you lose your health you know so a lot of people i feel like you know they they grow a lot in business but they miss out on their relationships with their spouse or with their children they then they grow a lot in business or they end up giving that money back in the hospital you know but means health is gone so i always uh, you know i was also in business we were also a multi crore business in 97 i ran we started in 84 with 4000 rupees as a investment 4000 me and my brother went into a multi crore business i left the business in 97 to help others all to grow in business now i say i tell people you never don't leave your business like i did but you make your business grow but you must have more and more free time for your inner self and passion second make your business grow but have more and more time for yourself and for your health 
So that's, uh, I always tell anyone and everyone that uh, even we run a Gurukul, we also run a lot of people, about 200 people are with me. But we are also teaching management and all. But management the other way, not the typical way of management. You manage yourself, then you can manage the other. So earlier she could not manage herself, so she could not manage four people. But today she is able to manage her emotion as she says. And so she is able to manage 800 people with her. So my always uh, take is be happy and then grow your business. Rather than grow your business and finally land up in the hospital. So I always say that from you also, you know, we love you, that means detachment. Means grow your business, but you always have that thing. I can survive with very you. And I think that is an example that there's so many people that are showing us simple living, beautiful, and beautiful. So that, that detachment is what I keep looking at because the outdoor numbers grow, the profits grow, and somehow sometimes they get flowed with it all. So you see Narayan Murthy's, I have Sudha Murthy's, I have Vivian, they're showing the real stories. So that's a combination, but they're the opposite. Okay, the <laughs> So like you said, you talk about exports. So we call it even uh, you know, some exports in Bangkok at the way that we have our stores and the uh, counters and the way, right in the public area. Now we're looking at uh, I think the easiest way to penetrate in any country is through Amazon. So we're looking at Amazon Australia, UK, US, and we're building up our manufacturing capacity to get that kind of different product line, that kind of quality because we're exporting on the set. Much better quality than we need. That's the first time we are investing into a huge assembly line production unit which is going to be at par. We are all talking about China plus one. But actually doing it is, uh, is exciting but it's also scary because you know it's bigger and bigger steps and yeah, more and more area is what I'm practicing. Yeah, just to uh, some of you may be curious to know what exactly we did in digital transformation. Because I think uh, we are in fashion industry, what we did may not be exactly right for you, but you will really get some idea. Uh, so if the holy grail in fashion industry is to decide what to produce, how much to produce, where to keep it, and when you really decide, saying that okay, something is selling or not selling, and if something is not selling, what to do with that? You will have to offer a discount. And if you don't really do it right, you can lose money. If you do it right, you can make a lot of money. So that is the nature of the fashion industry. So we said, fine, if this is the holy grail, let's really find, are there any digital tools? And we really forget that there is no ready-made digital tool that we can really borrow or buy and really use it. So we spent a year in building our own tool. What we really did, for example, we have got 500 points of sale. It could be our exclusive stores or it could be a corner in shop stop or lifestyle or 500. All of them are not same potential. For example, Exclusive stores do three, four times compared to uh, shop and shop. Even shop and shop, let's say shop and shop. The one in Kandivali will do very different business compared to one in Tana or one in Gorivali or whatever. So the profile of customers are different. The first thing is to really know the profile of customer. Obviously, we can't really stand there for 30 days and really actually get the profile. But we can really make some sense out of the profile of customers based upon what they actually buy. And if you understand what they actually buy, we get some sense of who the customers are and then we can start really feeding that store with whatever is likely to sell. So you really look at your past transaction history and then try and then put them in certain boxes and saying that okay, this seems to be the profile, cluster the customer profile, cluster the stores and start really merchandising which means deciding which item should really be kept in which store, in what quantity and then see whether that call is correct because if, if you made the right call then the sales will really grow faster than what it has been growing. If a store has been growing 10% year on year, you intervene based upon your understanding, based upon collecting the digital transaction data on a day wise, set a store wise and then really prepare a merchandise plan. If you're hypothesis is right, you'll start seeing the results. And if something is not really working, change your hypothesis, try different things, 
this is basically we really built a custom. First, we addressed this on deciding what to keep, and whatever is selling, we need to replenish every week. So, we didn't really want to have an army of people really doing it. Earlier, they were doing it. We automated that process. Now, a machine, which is basically fed by a program that we have really written or an algorithm which will really tell which item should really go in what quantity to which store when. This is one part. Having done that, we said, okay, like what else can we really do? Sometimes a store is needing certain item which is not there in the back end warehouse, but it may be lying somewhere else. In that location, it is not selling. Then the system will really tell you what you can stock transfer. Certain items are excess in some place, certain items are needed in some other place, you can really stock transfer. So that you don't really let the inventory lie waste. That also a digital program can really tell you. We really said, okay, let's really build that. The third thing it can really tell you is, in spite of your best efforts, across all stores, let's say certain item that you took a bet on, it didn't really. So there is excess stock, even at the three, four months into the season, then you need to take a decision on how much discount to offer. You can give 50 percent, then it will sell, but probably you won't make any money. Okay? Which is the right optimal discount? If I sell 20 percent, give 20 percent discount, will I really clear 80, 90 percent of my inventory? Or if it is not going to sell, I, do I need to take it to 30? Deciding exactly what should be the markdown, what should be the discount for each item. That needs to be again decided the program will really tell that. Having done these three things and the biggest holy grail which is basically deciding six months before the start of the sale because there is a manufacturing lead time of about three, four months. You need to decide what will I really need. Today as you really, one year later, what should really come, we are really designing. Design takes six months, manufacturing takes another four months which means one year before the actual product hitting the shelf retail shelf, we need to decide, do I make 3,000 of this, 500 of this, or 10,000 of this? If you make a mistake in that call, that is the biggest call. All the profit on paper will really simply vanish if you really made the wrong call. It is not that we don't make wrong calls, but if the errors is maybe 5%, but you have taken a call 80% of the time right, and the remaining 10-15 is basically average, then you really make money. So in fact, one first project, it took more than a year, and since there was no ready-made solution, we really invested our effort, is what is called automated replication system, plus the markdown management, plus basically buying. This, we really got it. Once we did it, we said, these are all for physical stores. Then we said, can it really be used for our online business? We have our own website, which is baggy.com, plus we sell in Amazon and Flipkart and Ajio and whatever else. Then we figured out that the complexity of online, the decision making, our existing algorithm was not really competent to handle all those variables. So we really tried tweaking. I don't really think that we've got it still right. We are still looking for are there, how are other brands in other categories are solving the problem. We have still not really found the right solution. So we are somewhere in between, but this is a journey. What did it really cost us to do? The first for offline, it cost us maybe about 20, 30 lakhs. So don't really go with the impression saying the digital transformation is going to be expensive. You pick the biggest problem and see whether there is an existing solution. If it is not there, there are a lot of, India is the programming capital of the world. I mean, for everybody, we really solve. If you really know what you want to do, there are a lot of programmers to really do it for you. And then it can be 10, 15, 20 lakh. And digital transformation journey is all about picking one project, finishing it, before moving on to the second project, before moving on to the third project. Once you have done two, three projects, you get confidence. Then you can start parallelly two, three projects simultaneously running. But do not really try to buy more than what you can really chew and digest at any point of time. Uh, so. Yeah. So the digital transformation journey is on and we've already achieved some of these and there's a lot more that we are looking at in the future and looking for partners for that. Um, so I keep on telling her that, you know, you, whenever she, business is all about taking chances and risks, 
as we all know. So you take that, like Ra Nagarajan ji said, that, you know, do not, what was the dialogue? Do not choose. Do not bite more than what you can chew. Do not bite more than what you can chew. So it's like you take, I always tell her, you take the risk, whatever she said, now we'll go to this, yeah, take. As long as, I, my question to her is, suppose this doesn't work and you come back to zero, are you okay, you know? So are you okay, if you are okay with that, then go and play the game. So I, I tell, I remind her rather, that it's a game. So business is also a game. Play the game where if you lose, it's perfectly okay, you can restart again. And that's what actually happened in the COVID time, like everything came to an absolute, for most of us people sitting here, then one of our friend, he came and he just told us, no, no, you do this, do this, do this, restart. So she went, I mean, hats off to her that she could go all alone in that <coughs> factory and restart. None of the workers were willing to come, but she said, no, I'll go. And she started to go and another four joined in, another 20 joined in, and then the 40 and 50 and then it came. So I think most importantly, keeping the emotions, keeping that energy up that during belief, the COVID time. Yeah, the belief was very much there that, okay, it went from here to absolutely rock bottom and everyone was uh, in a state of a panic, but she held her uh, nerve and her belief and her, so, yeah. And every time it's a belief, right? Now today when we are starting our own manufacturing, every time it's a, it's a belief that it's going to be China plus one or it's going to be India, just like for so many other things, India is a very cheap resource. Right, so same way, I think it's one step to one factory size and then a two bigger factory size, but it's always just a belief that, yeah, I can make it, Baggett can make it, I can do it, the country can do it. And I think that's where the energy that I get is I think most important, the energy work that I do on myself of taking out the negativities and letting that go. Nahi hua, drop it, keep moving ahead. So I say success is about two parts. One is the inner success, one is the outer success. Outer success is measured by balance of uh, bank balance and money balance and this balance, you know, all the stock balance, your assets, property. And uh, the other, other success is measured by how calm you are, how relaxed you are, how happy you are, how wonderful relations you have with people, how good a health you carry, how much you are enjoying the process. So there are always two parts to go. Uh, look, you look into your life to see which part, both need to be there and you enjoy the game, that's all. <laughs> okay. There were also many other challenges that we faced, uh, you know, so there was a time when I remember when we, we were, so that, yeah, there was one program that my husband conducts, which is called uh, Success. Success, the Success program. And before that I was always a car khanedar, that means I was manufacturing handbags for about 20 years. And uh, you know, it was like I was supplying to Regal Shoes, I was supplying to Shopper Stop, I was supplying to everyone. <coughs> and then when I did this program, that's the first time when I wrote down, actually wrote down what I wanted in my life, you know. And that time I wrote I want to have a, my own store. And my first store I did, I lost everything. Like literally the rent was so much that the cost of the product wasn't coming out. But I knew that, I knew that that mall wasn't good, but that was the only mall that was close to my house. I was, it was a nuclear family, I had a one year old child, I couldn't even think of going till you know, somewhere like Malad or it was really far for me. I did that and then maybe that belief of mine that it will not do well, but still I did it because I had it in my vision, I had written it, I want this to happen. My second store happened and I started breaking, breaking even. In the second store, the third store did that much profit that the first store ka losses bhi wo cover up. And then again, I came on at the test. I remember in the, our sixth store, I think it was in Delhi, we invested in a mall and it really flopped. And that guy, you know, Delhi wale, you go to someone and say, Bhaiya, we want to leave the store. Can you, you know, terminate the agreement? And then the landlord said, no, no, no. There's nothing like that I'm going to do. And then we went to some advisors and he said, legal notice, dal do, board, plaga do, uske We were like, no. And at that time, I remember, you know, the entire profit that the entire company was making was going in that store. I mean, that was the little profit that we were making and that was the amount of rent, you can imagine. But I still think that we held on to what we felt, no, yeah, go through it. Again, it's a thing of, you know, it's just a passing journey and you know you're going to go through it and it's going to come out superb. So I think seeing that, believing that, envisioning that, I think is what makes Baggett what it is. And, 
So there is one thing I wanted to share. Being small or being medium sized company, there is a greatest strength that you have or all of us have, which large companies don't have. Large companies, because they have been in existence for 50, 100 years, they have invested in, let's say, creating distribution. And the distribution has been fine-tuned over the last 30, 50, 60 years. In physical distribution, you can't really beat them. You can go nowhere near them. What is their strength is also their greatest weakness. Because we really, we had one bagit.com, which is a direct-to-consumer. Anybody can come to our site and can buy and we will really deliver. We were not happy with uh, the site and we really said, okay, like, let's really rebuild it. We rebuilt it. Now it is looking good and the business is improving, which is what we call D2C, direct to consumer. <coughs> Suddenly a thought came saying that if we can really deal with somebody in Asansor and I can really ship from Bombay, why can't we really use the same thing for B2B? That means the dealer, he may be in Nellore or he may be in Machili Patnam or he may be somewhere in Jammu or he, people who cannot really be reached directly by us because we don't do the distribution. Suddenly we can really reach them through B2B. That means the, instead of a consumer placing an order on our website, a dealer in a place that you know been and you'll never go in your life, you can really place an order and we can really service them because in any case there are couriers who will really take. Uh, we are building and I'm sure each one of you, and it doesn't really cost money, 10, 15 lakh. It gives you the power to reach maybe 5,000 pin codes. <coughs> what Amazon is able to do, you can do it. It doesn't cost money. And what it really does is in your category, if you're in FMCG, you can really fight the Hindustan Unilever or a Procter & Gamble or a Gotharaj Soaps or any Marico or Dabur. <coughs> what they have built over 50 years, the digital capability is giving you the same power, the same reach at a lesser cost. And those guys are in two minds only because of the fact they got army of people, they got thousands of distributors, they cannot really now leave it and then go to digital because they say, okay, what do I do with all the investment I made over the last 50 years? As far as we are concerned, we are not made much investment. We are a strong retail company both in online as well as in physical retail. We are not a strong distribution company. What is our weakness is basically giving us saying that, okay, what have we got to lose? We are nothing. We are not invested so much. Now, can we really take the D2C into B2B and do, when we do that, there is a cost saving. How do you really service all the dealers? You have to have a distributor in between. He is an intermediary. The distributor will charge you 8 to 10 percent of whatever the final price as his margin. What does he really do? He is basically buying from you, he is keeping his virus, he has got people who will really go and then collect orders from the retailer, deliver the goods and 30 days later or whatever the credit period he will collect and after that he will really pay. That is the role of a distributor. Now in B2B, if you can really incentivize the dealer to place order like a customer is placing directly on you and whatever credit you would have got from the distributor you give him a cash discount. Suddenly you really find what currently most of the people are spending 10% of the final selling price as the cost of distribution. You can do it in 3-4%. Why? Because anyway there is a fixed cost in really your B2B infrastructure. After that the variable cost is what? Anyway you got your warehouse. The only thing is the delivery charges. What is the delivery charge going to be? It may be 5%, 10%. In any case, in physical, through the distributor, you are incurring part of it. So, you will really save 10% which you are giving the distributor, maybe incur 4 or 5%. Instead, that is profitable. And since we don't really have anything to lose by switching to, this is like somebody moving from, which happened to me, from bicycle I went to a car. I really skipped the intermediate two-wheeler. Similarly, people who have underdeveloped distribution can use the digital tool to simply jump ahead of competitors who are large and who are vested in distribution for so many years. You need to figure out what can I do with the digital tools and technology available. Two small projects, critical projects, you will really make money. And it will give you the confidence and you can really beat large guy. Large guy, large size, 
they become inflexible you are agile you can you are flexible you can really run faster okay those guys are elephants they can't run fast so i think just want to recap a little bit of you know where i was explaining to you all about how we opened our own stores and it became profitable you know the fifth store the seventh store after the seventh store then there's no looking back today we are at about almost touching 100 stores going the franchisee route and all of that and obviously then that helps our cash flows it helps you know more skin in the game of so many more business partners and i think it's really interesting for you know females who want to run their own business so i think being in the fashion business and i think there's so many females who would like to have their own identity by having their own store and a small business of their own and that is what we are offering to many women franchisees even men are picking up the stores so we have lots more stores coming up but besides that there was one more call that i took at a point like when we were supplying to you know shop a stop they had come back to me with an offer that why don't you sell us under our label you know and at that point the quantity that they were giving me to produce for them was far larger than what i was producing and selling under the name of bagget it is very tempting yaar main hazar piece bech rahi hu to wo mujhe 10000 piece ka order de raha hai you know so to leave this i would have to jump into that bandwagon but i think at that point i said no what's the use we will just be doing job work for someone let us build something that's more our own identity again that was a call just like i said jyada log ko kaam denge to barkat aayegi aayi kafi time ke baad aayi but good whatever that was my sensibility at that point similarly i said way long back i said no we have to build a brand at that time there was no concept of brands in india but i think we are really really thankful that today bagget stands for a quality for a product that i think so many millions of women love and therefore we have been called here by access bank also <laughs> thank you so much sorry okay yeah any questions anything you'd like to ask me or nagarajan sir or manoj when you are quiet there are two reasons either you understood everything or you did not understand anything <laughs> okay so both ways is fine <laughs> thank you so much yeah thank you thank you thank you ms neera lekhi mr manoj lekhi and mr nagrajan for sharing such great insights with us i'm sure members of the audience have derived valuable takeaways from the session now i would like to invite mr nitin savan partner ernest and young india nitin supports organizations in understanding the advantages of cloud of for the implementation of the go to market strategies and digital transformation as the india cloud leader for ernest and young he has a great belief in the ability of technology and business tech networks to bring about significant change with over 20 plus years of experience working in technology leadership domain in organizations like ibm deloitte accenture emphasis He has continued to demonstrate a rich history of leading technology strategy, enterprise architecture, and complete complex large-scale implementation programs in the technology and consulting industry. He possesses expertise in mergers and acquisitions due diligence, enterprise architecture, cloud migration, big data, artificial intelligence. in the banking telecom and retail industries he also has extensive experience as a strong digital cxo advisor let's welcome mr nitin savant on stage good evening everyone i think e and y got mentioned in the earlier session <laughs> no i am taking it positively uh, so, so i think uh, that was a very good uh, story about how digital transformation journey is taken up right and what i would like to cover in my session today let me just bring up the 
presentation here. Yeah, so what I would like to cover today is really put up a framework to the really exciting and I think the passionate story that we heard around digital transformation from uh, Nina and uh, Nagarajan sir. So what is digital transformation and as a prelude to this session, I got a couple of mails from the organizers. The, the topic was digitization for SME industries and I wrote back to them about digital transformation. And then they wrote back to me saying digitalization of SMEs. Right? So multiple words here and I think I just want to start off with the differences between all of these three and these are stepping stones to really doing the complete digital transformation as that you really want to go towards and I think as we heard earlier it's a journey. So we will look at that. Uh, the question around why digital transformation I think was answered to some extent, but we look at the global as well as the environment that we are currently in, whether it is initiatives like Make in India, the pandemic, and also the robust economy that we have. How do we really seek the drivers for digital transformation and what are those success factors for digital transformation? We also talk about some of the challenges that your peer group as we are as consultants working with many of your peers in carving out their digital transformation plans, journeys. Finally, some of the really buzzword technologies that really are powering this uh, uh, digital transformation across industries. And these buzzwords, again, I think we have been hearing a lot in, in the media, but how do we really leverage them in a structured manner to take those steps towards digital transformation for your organizations. And finally, I think the last, but I think probably it should come as the first topic, is how do you measure the ROI of your digital transformation initiatives? And that's probably the most important question that the group here would like to understand and maybe not in this short span. But as we heard in the earlier session, every digital transformation, digital initiative, technology, adoption, cost money, right? And if that is the right investment and is there a sufficient business case and a ROI that's really going before we embark on those investments is a, a really moot question for digital transformation initiatives across all industries. I also understand uh, this is a Thane crowd, so there will be a lot of entrepreneurs here around manufacturing, uh, and uh, relevant industries in terms of how do we really transform our industries because mostly digital transformation gets spoken of in the whole B2C, customer facing, retail, cool customer experience, mobile apps, super apps. So how does the manufacturing enterprise leverage digital initiatives and digital technologies for their transformation because the set of customers, the kind of digital levers that they need for transforming themselves are probably slightly different from a retail or a customer facing uh, uh, entrepreneur out there. Few questions if you have the time, uh, but I will touch upon some of those on how digital roadmaps look like and you will see some digital POCs, initial steps around digitalization, digitalization and then the end goal of digital transformation. Uh, so what is digital transformation and that's really what we really want to look at. I think digitalization, we have all done it through the last many decades in the industrial revolution. How do you create a digital computer-based information? How do you create computer-based processes from what you used to do manually and probably more paper-based uh, in the earlier world? And we all know that and I think we are not at that stage. Uh, in the other probably there are some processes still in your enterprises which do happen by passing manual uh, 
paper documents, etc. I am sure there are initiatives going on for digitalization of those. And that's why I think the digitalization aspect comes in where once you have automated, reached a certain level of digital, the digitization, you are really then looking at digital initiatives to improve certain specific processes. And those are the steps which we heard in the earlier session is how do we tackle specific problems in your supply chain, in your distribution, in your HR systems, in your financial systems, and specific digital initiatives to tackle a specific problem using digital technologies. That is digitalized, digitalization. And that's the second step towards digital transformation. And if you have read the digital transformation all the material that's out there, all the MBA courses out there, the CDO digital transformation. The first step in digital transformation is not technology. The second step is not data. The first step is people. Right? And then when I say people, the, the processes which are being run by the people, the chain management that really needs to happen to move from the manual current processes to digital processes, the kind of collaboration that you need across different processes which are currently siloed and more so in the established enterprises. But as you heard earlier, you have already invested in some of those processes and there is a huge pushback in terms of going away from those processes because that investment would be lost. Some of the roles that are currently being done in a siloed fashion would merge due to the collaboration required by the digital transformation. So I think that's where the digital transformation is more about how do you really take the power of digitization and digitalization to really create a cultural and organizational change for the business transformation that you would need. And it will, it will really reflect in the kind of processes that you adopt using digital technologies at your workplace. Right? And that's, that's something which we will see through case studies as well. And, and I think the question about why digital transformation uh, is, is a very obvious answer to that is definitely we see as we grow and scale from the 95 crores that we heard to the 500 and 1000 crores that we really want to go to. It's a growth opportunities and as you scale it really becomes really difficult to govern, manage as well as operate some of the processes that you were operating manually earlier or with siloed systems earlier because you are not really, as you said, uh, good at all the parts of the business. Right? You might be good at the manufacturing part, you might be good at the uh, B2C uh, engagement perspective from the customer experience, but you might not be good at the warehousing part of your business, the supply chain, uh, complete distribution channels that you run. And all of these currently in the non-digitalized world would be certain partners who would be interacting with trusted partners but it still requires a lot of manual intervention and I think due to the increased competitive pressure whether it is because of the pandemic uh, that uh, you had to adopt digital technologies faster. Uh, really the holy grail as we heard is to really make all the parts of your business seamlessly interact with the usage of digital technologies. The enterprise core that you have currently, build a digital core to really interact with it and also with your supplier ecosystem, the partner ecosystem that you have. We look at some frameworks that really show you digital transformation in a box in terms of what kind of digital technologies you should be adopting as well as how do you retain the core as well because that's the system of record that you have. So what are the key success factors and like, like all the big four consultants, uh, we usually run a lot of surveys with both global as well as India based enterprises. And what we really did in the last couple of years during the pandemic and also post the pandemic to understand the digital transformation initiatives that different industries undertook. For example, one of our clients uh, is a, a very, very big Q QSR chain of restaurants. Right, all over India and they really want to become the McDonald's and the KFC of India. Right? Uh, and then 
the current mode of engagement is only physical stores. But during the pandemic, they had to go the digital way to really reach out, get on the bandwagon with the Swiggies and the Zomandos of this world. And I think as, we, as they came out of the pandemic, they really started thinking about completely digitally transforming their business and not really rely on partners for the different parts of the supply chain. So they really said, we should have our own D2C channels, as you rightly said. How do we really directly engage with the customers? How do we provide a digital experience to our customers? Right. So if I am going into a, I am going into a McDonald's or a KFC, how can I order while I am going towards the store? And how do I really get the using digital channels? And how do I really get that digital experience without me having to wait and reduce my waiting time uh, in terms of customer experience? So some of those physical and digital initiatives have come together and the traditional partners have uh, taken their digital transformation journeys in the time that they had during the pandemic, accelerated by the pandemic of course, but that was really a time where they really sat back and looked at the future way of doing business and not really relying on just the manual methods that they had. Now, Some of the success factors and the challenges that we found, uh, as you can see, is first one is more around how do you really decide the ROI and the return on investment that you would get? Um, and as we heard, the digital investments can be done quite at a re very reasonable price as well. Run few POCs, digital POCs, pilots to really test your ideas and then go the whole log once you have realized the benefits of your digital POCs. Secondly, the emerging technologies like IoT, cloud and AI are now table stake, right? So even if it's a completely manufacturing setup, uh, as we heard in the earlier session as well, how do we get insights quickly, whether it is the machines, whether it's the people, whether it's the ecosystem partners, the only way to do is really have your technology sensors out there, feeding you information real time, so that you can take those decisions of whether to place the merchandise in this store or the other in real time. And that's only possible through technologies like the Internet of Things, which is, in simple words, sensors across your ecosystem so that you can take decisions real time. Secondly, while so much data is coming into your enterprises, do you really invest in all the infrastructure that is required? And if you want to really be in and invest light, how do you leverage something like a cloud, which will only help you to test quickly some of these ideas and not really invest in a lot of capex upfront. Right, so that's the second technology which really is coming out as the key technology for uh, digital transformation. And finally, AI, uh, some of it, us might still call it analytics, plain old analytics and data warehousing, but I think with uh, GPT-3 coming out, everybody thinks that it's only a time, a matter of time before uh, we won't have to do anything and probably the AI engine will do everything, <laughs> right? So I think uh, these are the three technologies really being leveraged. Uh, and I'm sure all of you are leveraging them to some level of maturity here, but uh, that has come out as one of the key findings. Uh, as we build POCs and as we adopt some of these digital technologies, there is always a thought in your mind, is it better to acquire or build? Right? And maybe during the pilot phases it's okay to build, but beyond a certain scale and probably uh, that's something which as you go from a 500 crores to a 1000 crore, that's where the build versus buy decisions might need some more thought because uh, some of the features, uh, the time to market that you require might take a lot of energy to build and time as well when the competition goes ahead. So that's the way, that's the area where you really need to take a big choice and we have seen those, uh, I wouldn't say MSMEs, but the companies who are on the verge of really taking that big leap, a 5x kind of a leap into the maybe a unicorn kind of a company, taking those m &A decisions faster so that they can reduce their time to market. Right? And that's, that's a safe, uh, uh, step towards more scalability, I would say. And finally, um, I think talent shortages 
I think we, are, can, we can all talk digital till it comes through our ears, but who is really going to build, execute? Uh, and I think in India we are slightly more advantaged here because as you heard, we are the software capital of the world. And finding talent at different price points with uh, really excellent skills is not a challenge. Right? And you don't really have to go for the uh, big SIs uh, out here, uh, probably their focus is more global, but you would really, uh, you would really, you would be surprised at some of the work that firms like us do with uh, management graduates, engineering graduates on some of the key cutting technologies as well. So, so these, are, these are some of very high level findings, uh, more like uh, guidance for, uh, for your digital transformations. I would not belabor the point, but again, people, culture, operating processes and governance are much more coming out as uh, stumbling blocks for digital transformation than technology. And I think probably we know this at the back of our mind, but uh, really the entire organization living and breathing digital is something which uh, really has made many of the digital transformation stories successful across whether it is a MSME or a last day enterprise. This is a, again a slide where uh, we are really stressing that unclear digital transformation goals and uh, the overall leadership alignment are the key, two major areas uh, and causes for transformation failure. Try to keep it as small as possible so you cannot read it. But, <laughs> but I think the key messages are around governance primarily and uh, really not having your, your goals clearly you find upfront very before you embark on your transformation journeys. So what are the key components when you say a digital transformation platform and it's a platform based story and platform that you are really creating for your enterprise of the future. Uh, very uh, common parts of your business come immediately to the fore. Uh, primarily it's the procurement process, the commerce platform, whether it is B2C or B2B, so those are, and I'm still uh, reeling out the initiatives that we are seeing mostly adopted uh, in the overall digital transformation journey. Analytics, definitely visualization, how you really uh, analyze the data that you're getting from your across the business and taking decisions faster. The complete supply chain, how do you make it end-to-end -end automated and digital across your partners and within the enterprise as well. Next is the customer interface platform, whether it is your internal customers as well as your uh, external customers. How do you really provide a single platform for customer interface? And finally, how do you understand your customers? Right? And that's really coming out very uh, strongly to the fore in all digital transformation journeys is the entire CRM and loyalty piece for your customers. And how you really understand the profile of your customer and how you target your campaigns as you heard in the earlier session as well towards a specific set of customers and how do you encourage it, encourage them to come back to you whether it is a manufacturing large piece or a B2C uh, product that you are uh, uh, serving the world with. Right, so these are some of the digital core applications, platforms, initiatives on the right hand side you have the supplier ecosystem uh, and, and that's something which uh, is also undergoing a huge transformation in terms of automation. There are software as a service platforms which you can leverage without buying them and really link with your ecosystem partners as well uh, in a much more rapid fashion than you would do earlier. Uh, uh, smart contract management platforms how you really manage the inbound logistics and the supplier management life cycle. So, so some of these larger blocks and this is more towards catering towards the manufacturing industry entrepreneurs here. Uh, you will not probably see some of the cool stuff around uh, digital channels uh, or the super app kind of capabilities out here uh, because that would be more B2C. But, but the customer interface platform would uh, take care of that to some extent. But here the key message is you are not throwing away your, your enterprise code. 
you are adding and augmenting it with the digital code as well as the uh, automation of your external interactions with your suppliers and ecosystems. And that's the approach we are seeing most of the organizations because we are, and especially we as MSMEs cannot throw away our, our investments. We are invested, we are using, people are trained, so it's a big investment for us to really start from scratch and that's the approach we are seeing across MSMEs to really uh, maintain the enterprise core and build the digital core around it. So we heard a lot of uh, technologies driving digital transformation and I would say the one, the, the few there out uh, in the center out there and we are calling it the third platform. The first platform was definitely the mainframes and the, uh, really the uh, legacy systems uh, maybe a couple of decades back. But I think we have moved away from those and some of these technologies like cloud for faster scalability, internet, internet of things for more insights from your devices and external uh, engagements as well as the power of AI to get insights into your data as you build your common data models uh, across all your parts of the business are really driving the digital transformation. Some of the industries we are also seeing uh, some initial uptake of AR VR technologies especially in the health industries, uh, also in the education industries as well, the training, the workplace industries, yeah. Yeah, the first platform is, uh, is more technology based, so we used to have main mainframes uh, where we started off and there's really systems where you invested a lot and had to spend a lot of time uh, really making them so that was the first platform. The second platform is Probably some of us are, I mean, most of us are working in terms of client and server. So we have a laptop and you connect to some server, so that's the second platform. But what's really happening is this boundaries of different layers are breaking away. You are interacting in a distributed fashion to whatever technology comes from the third platform, which is the analytics, the cloud, and which are not, many of them are not owned by you. First two platform probably you had to buy some amount of it yourself. But I think these are software as a service kind of uh, technologies which you can leverage and pay as you go. So I think the initial space uh, where we see adoption in the MSME space is definitely open source technologies and a lot of uh, software as a service kind of capabilities. Uh, not the expensive ones but the reasonably, pri reasonably priced uh, ones where we really uh, want to test the waters, use them as per our uh, budget for the month and many of these uh, software as a service technologies come on a monthly subscription basis uh, which is very good for exploring some of these new technologies uh, till you make that long term decision of really investing in the upfront on the KPEX side. Right, so, so all of these technologies again driving digitalization, digitization and digital transformation across your finance uh, functions, the HR functions, supply functions, sales and marketing functions. Uh, you find uh, most of these technologies as the foundation for creating that digital platform and automation uh, across these functions. You could, and this, this complex diagram does not mean that you need to buy 20 different applications and invest separately you could take a decision of uh, having a single product or uh, investing in open source options or taking a step by step approach and we'll see some of those approaches as we go by. Right and then I think this really is about how you increase the adoption of these technologies because as we are going and taking this digital transformation journey we are also seeing these technologies also mature. So what was cloud 10 years back is a different set of services on the cloud now, right? And, you would, uh, and uh, what was uh, probably more IoT, right? Uh, five years back is a different set of services and capabilities on the IoT platforms now in, in today's world. So as you take these journeys, the technology landscape and maturity is also increasing, which will help you leverage more services and 
uh, use and increase your adoption of the digital technologies as you take the transformation journeys. So how do you measure ROI? I don't know, where does the first step of your digital transformation start? And it doesn't start on the left hand side, it starts on the right hand side. And as owners of your own firms and really managing your uh, enterprises, you know that some of these business values and the ROI factors are the reasons for you to think about digital transformation and digitalization. So whether it is revenue uplift, there is profitability improvement, improved visibility across your supply chains, so that you can take faster decisions and complete overall operational control of all your internal tech for business and tech for tech applications within the enterprise. And what we and this is from a case study that uh, we have for a client. Uh, I'll not tell you how much we charge for them, but uh, the, 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 we started off with uh, the right hand side, worked with their key leadership to understand for from the three years perspective and the five years perspective what were the key imperatives that they really wanted to target. Came back, uh, had deep dive, deep dive discussions with their CXOs. Uh, finalize the KPIs that they would like to really measure for these business value factors and then started looking at what capabilities they need to build on the digital side. So whether it is acceleration in sales conversion cycle, right, could be one KPI from the revenue uplift and you still do not have an online e-commerce channel. So it was the uh, uh, end product of all of the business thinking that came to the decision that from digital initiative perspective, I need to have an e-commerce portal so that I can increase uh, and have a faster time to market, of course, but improve my customer service, accelerate my sales conversion cycle and then really uh, achieve that business goal which is revenue uplift. So some of those capabilities we saw in the earlier one but the key message here is really starting with your KPIs, which I think we heard here as well on, in terms of what were the business KPIs that we wanted to start off with, increase the reach right, and improve customer experience, right, really give them a feeling of having bought an authentic product. How do you really do that? And then there are other, other digital initiatives that they started, but some of these are really key. Product design and development. We heard that yeah, in the earlier session. Supplier collaboration, how do you really find out new ways of really improving your distribution channels and suppliers and beating the big guys to their game. And then finally, how do you have an integrated business process? Probably initial days for MSMEs to uh, think about an SAP, an ERP, etc. I'm sure some of you already have that, but, uh, but, but you could really get into uh, some, some really cost-effective solutions as well to create those integrated business processes to start with using our digital solutions. So, so I think ROI business value definitely the starting point. Um, <coughs> what I really wanted to uh, speak about was some case studies on how that entire journey was taken and I will mean, go away from the theory part quickly. Uh, this is again an advanced manufacturing uh, enterprise where we sat with them to evaluate their priorities across the now, the next and beyond. And then as we saw earlier and really define what kind of capabilities they need uh, based on the business objectives that they came up, came to us on the now, next and beyond. So what they said is we really need a, a new digital access experience for the customers a digital supply chain, right? A, a digitally integrated functions within and external to the enterprise, and I think I'm sure very soon it will hit all of us is sustainability, and especially uh, in your business as well and the environment effects, etc. I think we'll start seeing digital initiatives around ESG very soon, with not only from the compliance side but also to reach out to a different set of customers who value some of the ESG factors before they buy a product and it's really happening very fast out there outside India and uh, picking up in India as well. So how do you really 
measure your ESG compliance and the environment friendliness of your products to your customers is going to become really important uh, for you as you take up the digital transformation initiative. So we really sat down this with this customer to evaluate their priorities and uh, uh, then came up with the themes and the capabilities on the left hand side. So to each, achieve each of these uh, themes, what are the digital interventions that they would, they would need to do. Right? And then it all came down to the technology solutions uh, I will not belabor the technologies there, but the key message here is it was the need of the business, it was part of the vision, uh, some of the themes were near term, some, some of them were next and then some of them maybe on a 3 to 5 years horizon and, and only then we really, uh, we should go for the digital interventions required to achieve those business objectives. What we did then was really prioritize them. And uh, I think this is something which uh, all of us should do. The business impact and the time to implement. Right? So we really put all of those initiatives on a scale of is it faster to implement and how much really is the business impact. And made sure that we really touch the faster implementation and the highest biggest impact to start off with. Right? And maybe uh, for this group, it is also the cost of implementation that would be the third lever uh, which will uh, really make those decisions faster so that uh, we get the fastest ROI out of the initiatives and the investments that you make in your digital transformation journey. Okay. So what we come, what we should actually come up with is then a digital strategy a roadmap. And you will see some of these activities here in terms of prioritization, how do you really create the digital partner strategy, uh, interventions that you would need to streamline your processes or automate your processes as per the earlier prioritization that you did. And finally, create a business case. And this phase is just about creating a business case by doing pilots. Right? You, before you take the big leap towards investing completely in a specific technology or an area of business that you would like to transform. How do you really create that benefit case? Get all the stakeholders, whether it is a CFO, CIO, the CEO, all of them on the same page so that the initiative succeeds once it begins. I think we should have all of them uh, on the same page before we start a digital initiative and finally uh, create that roadmap which then gets tracked in terms of the execution plan, right? So the priority initiatives, uh, which quarter they should be driven towards. Uh, also, and here again you are seeing, if you are evaluating some new technologies, even in this, this phase, you would run a few POCs with the, with maybe the OEM vendors or maybe in-house as you did Mr. Nagarajan. So uh, that's part of the learning cycle uh, as you really start and it's, I think the timelines out there are important, right? You are not seeing immediate gains. We heard earlier it took a year of investment, effort, understanding the nuances of your business issues and fine-tuning your digital solution as well. Uh, so it's a journey and, uh, and to maintain that motivation is really to start seeing early wins in quarter two, quarter three so that the overall motivation of the team also remains so that we make those larger transformation changes with more buying from everyone in the enterprise. Uh, another one here is more uh, uh, fashion and retail, uh, but they are more into manufacturing with the ecosystem of manufacturing partners across the globe. So uh, there is a brand. Uh, they, they, they manufacture for multiple different brands and as you heard, can you manufacture for Shopper Stop? So these are, this is a global multinational company who manufactures for different global brands. And here again we started off with the digital capabilities needed by them, but you will see the top line uh, objectives, the efficiencies that they needed in their business because there are multiple vendors spread across multiple different cities, states, geographies 
uh, risks of compliance, regulations, quality because the customers were global and as we said, as we export, the complete quality benchmark changes whether it, what you are probably not that much now because we of course uh, manufacture good quality uh, products here in India as well but I think as the quality uh, uh, parameters increase as you start exporting you really need to be having an automated digital solution to make sure that all the boxes are ticked off because you cannot afford to have the consignment come back because of a very small quality defect as well so I think that's something which uh, was one of the key factors from the business side that they came up to us and finally how do you really bring synergies between these different partners was one of the business problems that they raised and you will see the capabilities is, in, is not really changing too much but unless you have defined your business objectives choosing the right capabilities becomes very difficult and hence and you cannot go back once you are invested and gone and taken a few steps uh, coming back is an expensive thing but I think uh, again we are relabeling the point that having the growth aspirations and the efficiencies required by the business at the foremost before you start a digital transformation discussion is most imperative same KPIs on the right hand side you will see and this is the case study that I was talking about uh, what really comes back again, the message is what are your now, next and beyond initiatives and what is the kind of impact they will give you. Uh, a heat map in terms of prioritization of initiatives is something which is really, really uh, important for you to start measuring and then uh, taking the next steps uh, on, on your transformation initiatives. The third one is uh, also very similar. Uh, a uh, case study where the first part of it is digitization, it is not digitalization. The second is more around data and how do you really get insights, uh, second and third both. And then how do you really improve the customer facing experience, uh, the mobility of your uh, business. Uh, this is again a business where uh, they wanted to and, and very soon we will start seeing drones for uh, delivering products as well. So, uh, some of those technologies were also uh, came out of the strategic goals of the enterprise. And similarly, then we really, for each of those goals, we really created this kind of a snapshot. And I think something which you should do is what is the problem statement, what are the initiatives, what is the scope of the solution, and indicative timelines for really achieving this and the estimated cost. Unless you reach this level of maturity, we, uh, we should really not proceed. Uh, and then this again as a buy-in from the entire CXO team and the MD, the CEO of the organization. Uh, multiple such dashboards that we created for different business objectives. Whether it is the order to cash process, whether it is the manufacturing operation dashboard, uh, control towers as we call them now. Uh, so, so, really specific and again you will see the nine box model in terms of the impact, business impact as well as the ease of implementation right? and those are the boxes and you will see uh, the top right corner being green which is a green signal for you to really, uh, uh, I, would, I would really like it to be uh, all for all your initiatives really come to this stage before you really embark on uh, full scale investment in your uh, digital initiative as well. So some of these uh, I think experiences is something which I wanted to share and the journeys that uh, people are taking as technologies evolve as well as their ambitions also grow uh, in our economy. So I think that's all I had uh, open for questions. Yeah, yeah, some of them, I think the, the, the second one was for SME. The first one uh, was, yeah, it, was, it is a slightly larger manufacturing company. So, because some of, and you are right. So, when you see the capabilities, you can make out the maturity and the size of the organization. Absolutely. Yes, yes. So, so that's too much for, as I said earlier, the ERP 
this is a slightly an overkill for an MSME at this stage. But of course, the ERPs also have smaller express versions that you can still start uh, using them. So, does ENY have anything for SMEs? Because I know you do a lot for big corporates. Do you have any? Because you know, SME cannot afford. Yeah, yeah, so uh, that's uh, not the right message. So, we, I myself do a lot of assignments on digital transformation which are in the range which Mr. Nagarajan mentioned. <laughs> and it's really, uh, we, we will really want to be part of those stories uh, because we know that these are the unicorns of the future. So, we really engage with a lot of uh, entrepreneurs and we have a, uh, uh, this just last uh, month, we hosted along with TI, the global TI uh, the entrepreneur global in Hyderabad with the co-sponsor. So really work with a lot of startups and entrepreneurs to make sure that the best uh, strategy knowledge is not waiting for uh, a heavy investment for them. And we do work with SMEs. Yes, I am familiar. Yes. Right, so I think as you. Right, so the question is can you throw some light on the privacy? Uh, and, and I think it goes back to what you are trying to really create as you become a digital enterprise is to create a digital core where many of those components from the technology side are outside the physical boundary of the enterprise. And especially the uh, financial transactions that you are having with and the platforms which we heard Axis has and many of the banks have is going to really uh, create a bridge between the on-prem systems as well as the uh, external ecosystem partners as well as uh, the uh, financial institution that you would look for credit etc. as well. Uh, but I would say, and, and, and I did mention cloud a couple of times. So some of the, those aspects, uh, MSMEs and even large enterprises probably uh, have that first question: in, Is it secure enough? And as you go multi-geography, multi-country, uh, we uh, insulated from those vagaries of the business as well. And I would say that in terms of both compliance and regulatory uh, direction, we are. Uh, there, so even if it is a cloud and probably MSM should start looking at it from day one what the banks and the NBFCs are also doing in terms of making sure that your data resides in the country so that you are protected, right? It could be a primary and secondary version which uh, as mandated by RBI you could do uh, those trade-offs but making sure that uh, those uh, data residency uh, aspects are taken care of by the software that you are using as well and do your due diligence around that. Right? And uh, it's, it's, it's when I say security, I think some of these technologies are more secure than you can imagine. So imagine an MSME having a great security expert in their IT team. Would he be uh, the most effective in making keeping your uh, enterprise secure or would that be an Amazon or a Google who has thousands of engineers working on the uh, latest ransomware attack and making sure that the uh, cloud has the latest patch and protecting you from that. Right? The data going out is one aspect of it, but it's probably going more increment, uh, encrypted. But I think we are getting away from the question on uh, sh should we go to cloud rather than uh, so that question is no longer being asked by customers. It's about when should I go to cloud and what what are the different privacy aspects that I should take care of before taking that plunge. So, and it's about uh, the cost savings and the investments upfront that you would do versus the other advantages of agility, faster time to market that you would get with some of these technologies. You know, so I think uh, there are multiple stages of the uh, uh, stages of the digital journey. So I think first is to really understand that there is a need for transformation. The second uh, least expensive step is to really 
figure out what are the key priority digital initiatives that you would like to take, which you have already taken. Now, the entire digital transformation is now something when you start thinking as you are growing. Uh, by that time, you will have enough uh, money to afford an UI. So, <laughs> so no, no, but I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Uh, correct, correct. So I think it's not, it's not more about uh, getting a big four consultant to advise you on digital transformation. It's absolutely not. I think what really matters is uh, the business imperatives will throw those problems and the solutions that you will find will be digital solutions as you have found with Mr. Nagaraj, right? You wouldn't have solved them with your manual way of doing that for some 200 people. For 800 people you understood as an entrepreneur ki bhai ye chahiye humko. He bata sakta hai or he can take us to the next level, right? So that's something which is something you invest in a consultant as your uh, and, uh, and a strategy officer on your, for your understanding the vision that you have. Versus if you really want to just get an overview and what are the things that probably are the gaps in my digital uh, to take that leap from the digital and what technologies I can leverage, it's not very... Uh, I have a question. We need to really engage uh, people who know a lot more in depth. The only thing is that we are really looking for a partner who will really structure the fees linked to performance rather than saying, that, okay, this is my fee, pay me, and I I am sure that I've helped hundred other people, like you will also get help. Small and medium enterprises, they don't really have that risk tolerance to blindly follow because the investments are large. As she says, if there is a return on investment, which is more than our cost of capital, why would we not really invest? Of course we'll invest. It doesn't really matter whether it's five crore or fifty crore. It's just that that initial hesitation, if there is a way we could really work with people like you and you, you and, and Accenture, where you're saying, I'm willing to put my skin in the game, I'm really willing to take a fee, which is linked to performance, which is linked to proof of concept, which is linked to whatever is the value that you're really expecting. If that is there, half the problems are over. Yeah. You have hundred other people wanting to take a card so that they will call you tomorrow morning first thing you'll get calls from us. And I think we do those kind of engagements as well where we have as you said the skin in the game. We will run the run the entire whole on in the journey with you and it will be outcome based. Of course those are longer discussions and we do get into those operating models. So absolutely open to that. Yeah, I think I will echo what uh, Mr. Nagraj just said. So we started off uh, going with a SAP by design. I think we were at, at that time 35 crores. Today at 100 crores we are still not able to implement it because they are not in a position to customize it according to what we need. Right. So you know it, it's a struggle It's uh, and, and you have already paid a lot of money up front. So we thought of where we would be around uh, you know, let's say in 2025, 2026. Based on that we took the plunge you know, a couple of years back. But uh, just you know, over a period of two years, my colleague here will uh, echo my thoughts. It's been a, a very challenging uh, process trying to get a company like SAP to you know right. customize it according to what we need. No, I think yeah. So I think the what I hear from is that when you started, the vision was to really uh, have a package solution. Right, which will meet the needs of your vision. Right? But I think in the implementation phase, you have realized that your business is unique and there would be customizations required and probably that's where in the initial phases of deciding the product. And maybe you did not know when you started off that there would be so much customization required. Uh, yeah, but, but you know, at the point, at, at the time when, when it is being sold to you, you know, everything looks uh, very hunky-dory. But then, unfortunately, you know, it was uh, COVID, people could not travel, but even post uh, of, uh, you know, the restrictions, uh, we found that uh, there was a lot of skepticism to travel and understand the business and try to, you know, right. structure uh, and uh, right. do no, everything I, according I mean, to you, what I think required. For all that, the that is something which, uh, you know, what Mr. Right. Nagarajan just right. mentioned, it needs to be your skin in the game equally in, in, in this, uh, 
people are ready to invest. You know, if you have a long-term vision, you will invest. But then you also need to then in that case. You know, yes, yes, and absolutely we do that. I think uh, open forum here, so we definitely do that, and we are open to discussing that with you. And we do outcome-based uh, engagements as well. Have the skin in the game because I think more and more as our economy is growing. Uh, customers are also realizing, as in based on the challenges that they have faced in the past, that uh, we cannot really just take a consultant, take a product to EM, and then uh, it's uh, and he doesn't take the ownership of the success or failure along with us. So, uh, and you will find even the other consultants talking to you about uh, these models as well. So, I think good inputs for everybody here as well that such models do exist. Uh, you just need to speak with the, the consultants and the OEMs in terms of taking more ownership and accountability of the success of the business and going with them. So we, we do that uh, quite often. Of course, it takes a lot of uh, back and forth in terms of what that success means, measuring it. Because on the other side, uh, and this is something which I think as an, uh, owners, entrepreneurs here ask for you as well in terms of Defining those KPIs and sticking to the achievements of those KPIs and giving and measuring the right credibility also of those successes. I'm sure when we start we have all the right intentions in mind but what we as consultants, whether it is global or Indian or whatever, it's finally when it comes to outcome measurement and giving credit, that is when uh, both sides see, oh this was not because of you. This would have anyway happened if it is a success, right? So the, those define those need to be defined very appropriately, and it's a collaborative thing, right? And uh, we are, I mean, that should be the start of the journey where the if the KPIs are not defined appropriately, it could lead to a lot of dissatisfaction on both the sides, and we have seen that uh, happen in some of these. It's a very not completely a objective thing, right? So that also is the other side of this uh, discussion. But definitely with you, I think, and there are those models when you get consultants with OEM. So you find many RFPs, maybe the larger companies, coming with for some of these technologies, SI plus, SI plus consultant plus OEM. Tino saath mein ao, tino skin in the game leke ao, or outcome based banao. These are the three players you need for your digital transformation. The consultant who maybe program manages it, the SI who develops it, and lots of OEMs, cloud, cloud, sub, sub, me like you and one like to joke and you sign up as a consortium for your outcomes. Vese wala deal you should start pushing towards, not in our best interest, but <laughs> but it is in the book. If it's a growing economy, growing business, it's in everybody's interest. Right? So we, an outcome based, and that's the other thing, outcome based pricing will be more than your current run of the mill pricing, which is fine because there is additional risk you will take, but everybody's skin is in the game. In the interest of time, may I request that this conversation be taken forward while networking. Yeah? May I request Ms. Nina, Mr. Manoj, Mr. Nagarajan, and Mr. Savan to please come on stage. Uh, may I request Bijoy and Salim to be on stage and present a bouquet to our esteemed speakers for taking out their valuable time.
speakers for sharing the valuable insights and to all our guests for taking their precious time out to attend this session. I hope the session was useful and we shall ensure we will come back to you next year with a new theme so that we can all evolve together. Before we end this session, your thoughts are very valuable to us. Hence, I request you to please fill in the forms and submit at the registration desk. I now request everyone to please proceed and join us for drinks and dinner. Thank you so much.